Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Providence. Good to see everybody this morning, even though we are small in number, but we are still here. And we're ready to worship the Lord. Just a couple of quick announcements, and then we'll get with that worship. At the close of this service, we'll have lunch upstairs. Everybody is invited to stay with us and have lunch. Great food and great fellowship. And then uh, tomorrow, I hope you have a wonderful Memorial Day as we take time to remember all those that gave the ultimate sacrifice. Let's not ever forget to pray for our military and everybody that serves so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we have uh, here in America. Wednesday night, everything will change. There'll be no meal until September, but we will still have our youth meet at 7. We'll still have our midweek Bible study here at 7 in the auditorium. And then there's a note about a building fund for the remodel upstairs in the kitchen. And then there's a uh, there's some, some looking ahead dates for a deacon's meeting and a conference. And then on the back, there's a, there's a special announcement for our cookbook committee. And if you have any questions, there's a list of ladies that you can ask those questions to. And then if you need to contact our Pastor Don, Pastor Sean, or Miss Linda, their information is there on the back. Miss Linda said Don is coming along great. Uh, and that we will see him hopefully Wednesday. Is that correct, Miss Linda? Possibly Wednesday, but for sure Sunday? It's okay. We will make it somehow or another. But we do look forward to seeing our pastor. Any other announcements I may have missed? If not, let's pray and we'll begin our service. Father, we do thank you again for a wonderful morning. We thank you for the time we had in Sunday school. We thank you for your wonderful word that we get to, that we get to, uh, that we get to enjoy and understand the revelation of yourself to man. Now, Father, we just pray that our, our hearts are ready for worship, and as we sing songs, that they are from the bottom of our heart with thanksgiving and praise unto you. And then as your word goes forth, we pray that we absorb that word, and as we go out, we live that word. We do thank you and praise you for all the, the grace that you have given to us. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. If you will take your bulletin, um, the words are in it, and we are going to sing What a Mighty God We Serve. Please stand. <laughs>
thank you for um, this Memorial Weekend. And we thank you for your love and your grace that you give to us uh, that we don't deserve, Lord, but we're thankful for. Father, we pray healing for everybody that's sick. We pray for our pastor. And we just pray that you restore and just yeah, redeem and restore. Lord, we love you. Uh, we commit this time to you as we worship you. In Jesus' name. Please turn to hymn number 456. Precious Lord, take my hand. following this timeline of Jesus after his resurrection into his glorified state and then um, his ascension on high where he's seated right now on his glorious throne. And, and, and that tells us of the, the glorious promise that he will eternally be sitting on the throne. Setting up his new kingdom. 
And last week, we, we also were in Acts chapter 2, but in the beginning of Acts chapter 2, and we studied the day of Pentecost and what that really means. And I was anticipating that being sort of the final in this series, but as I continued reading, this, this piece of Scripture just really stood out to me. So, I'm going to start in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through verse 47. And if you remember from last week, the very last thing that happened was after the great miracle, 3,000 souls were saved. 3,000 unbelievers became believers. So this is what happened directly after that to those 3,000 believers. I want to mention before we read this word this morning that this is a challenge for us individually. It's a challenge for me. It's a challenge for you. But it's also a challenge uh, for the people around you, the people in your life, your family, um, your church family, and just everybody you know. So would you read God's Word with me? Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. God's Word says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, King of the universe, Lord, we thank You just for this morning to gather together, to hear Your Word proclaimed. Lord, I pray for every soul here today that as the Word goes out, they would receive it with joy and excitement and hunger and maybe a new hunger that they haven't had before. Father, we thank You for this opportunity just to gather, to lift Your name on high, to exalt You and worship You. Father, would You lead us and be with us this morning. In Jesus' powerful name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now before going into every verse here, I just want to say, there's kind of a belief about this passage that this is what the apostles did. They had all things in common. They, they sold all their things. They did all that because they had to do it. And that's true. They, they literally had to do this for the church to survive. But I don't want us to read this passage and think, oh, they had to do that. It doesn't apply to me. The truth and the beauty of this text transcends generations and has great application for us today. So look at verse 42. We're going to spend most of our time in verse 42 because there's so much here. Verse 42 says, And they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to four things, and we'll get into that. But first, I want to talk about who the they is. As I said before, they is the 3,000 souls. Look at verse 41. So those who received His Word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. The very next verse says, And they, those 3,000 souls, the brand new believers, the brand new converts of the early church, they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to four things. So I want to ask us a question this morning. And I'll go back to this question at the very end. But are you devoted are you devoted? I believe everybody's devoted. It's more of a question of what are you devoted to? What are you devoted to? This, this Greek word that, that translates to devotion, it means to continue to do something with intense effort. What do you do with intense effort? 
For some of us, that might be um, sports. It's not a bad thing. Some of us, that might be shopping or watching TV. Maybe some of us watching TV with intense effort. But we are all devoted to something. But I want to show you all what the early church, the early converts of Jesus were devoted to. Look at the beginning of verse 42. It says, And they, the 3,000 new believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So this is the first thing that the new believers were devoted to. They put intense effort towards the apostles' teaching. So what did the apostles teach? What did the apostles teach? Right before this, in Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter taught the gospel of Jesus, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, through the entirety of the Old Testament. Showed how Jesus had to die. So what the apostles taught is this. The Word of God. They were devoted to God's Word. So the question is, are you devoted to God's Word? I like to think of the Bible as our spiritual food. The, 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 the Bible, God's voice, God's Word, we need to be consuming it. We need to be reading it, spending our time in it. If I go a day without eating, I am miserable. If I go two days without eating, I'm sick. Three days, verge of death. I don't know if that's true. That might not be true. But <laughs> you get the idea. So why is it that, that we feel comfortable not having our, our spiritual food every day? We should, we should be devoted to the Word of God. Hungry, passionate to hear God's voice. This is the primary way He speaks. If we say we want to hear the voice of God, but we don't open His Word, it's like, a, what are we expecting? I want to read something very quickly from Luke chapter 24. You don't need to turn there because I won't be there long, but if you want to, that's fine. In Luke chapter 24, after Jesus resurrects, He appears to two of His followers, um, not, not two of the twelve, but two of his larger followers. And they didn't recognize him because his glorified state was a mystery. But, but listen to this. Now, after they walked seven miles, listen to what happened. Verse 30 in Luke 24. When he was at a table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And the two followers' eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. And he vanished from their sight. Now listen to this. They said to each other, the two followers said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us when he opened the word to us? When the word is opened to you, and your eyes are open to see that the Word of God is truly what it says it is. That it's the inspired Word of God. That God breathed it. That all of it declares Jesus as God. Your heart will burn. Your heart will burn for God's very Word. If your heart is not burning for God's very Word, your eyes are not open to what it is. Our eyes are blinded to the beauty and the truth of what God's Word is. And what it is, is His voice. This is the breath of God. These words are the voice of God. Amen. We need to cherish that. I want to tell a quick story of someone I've recently become friends with. He goes to the college, um, <clears throat> to Coe Falls College, but he, last year at about this time, he was, he was wild. He was crazy. He was just, I mean, he, he was an athlete at the school, so he wasn't there for, for Jesus or anything, but he just wasn't following the Lord at all. And I met him earlier this year, and he was just trying to, to get closer to the Lord. 
And we started meeting and having Bible studies because, I mean, he lives like a minute away from me. And <laughs> earlier, I guess this was about three weeks ago, we, I said, after, after our first Bible study, I said, we got to do this. Let's try to do this once a week. And he was like, I was going to ask if we could do it every day. And it was so, like, he, he, he is so youthful and passionate about the voice of God, about the Word of God, that he wanted to spend every day just, just learning and, 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 and reading his Word and being excited and receiving it with gladness because his heart burned for God's Word. Our hearts should burn for the Word of God. That is what devotion to God's Word is. Looks like. I want to challenge us. Be devoted to God's word. Look at the next thing in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And this is the second thing. And to the fellowship. The fellowship. The church is built on fellowship. This is probably a word we've heard often. Fellowship. It means uh, joining together, coming together, community, more than friendship, it's, it's, it's the idea of bearing one another's burdens, loving each other, doing life with each other. So I want to challenge you to, to grow in fellowship as a, as a church, yes, but also in your families, with your friends, with other believers, really love them like Jesus loves them. Do you know the Bible tells us to love each other as much as we love ourselves? And, and the, 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 the depth behind that word love is more than just, oh, I love you. I care about you. No, it's, it's, it's the idea that you feed yourself. You clothe yourself. You take care of yourself. You meet your own needs. So if I love somebody else, if I love a brother or a sister in the faith and they have a need... To love them biblically is to meet their need, to help them, to bear their burdens. And I, I mean, I even think about right now, just in our church, I would wonder how many people here might have a need that somebody else could meet. If we have something that someone else might need, or we have a skill that someone else might need, maybe someone needs their grass cut and they just they, they can't do it anymore. This is the idea of fellowship. It's more than just saying, I care about you. It's, it's loving each other in action, in word and deed. Look at verse 44. It says, and all who believed were together. And they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any who had need. Now understand, they had to do this for the church to survive, but it's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture. There's these believers that had plentiful, they had a lot. And then there's these believers that had nothing. And they came together and they said, these people said, I'm going to sell what I have to love you. I'm going to sell what I have so you can have what you need. It's a beautiful picture of realizing when, when, you're, when you're a believer in Jesus, it's not just about me. The Bible says I'm a part of the body of Christ. I'm a part of the body of Christ. Whether we like it or not, we're connected in the body of Christ. We are, we are one body. It's not about me at all. In fact, the Bible tells me to die to myself, to deny myself. I think a beautiful way of denying yourself is just helping your brothers and sisters in the faith. There's this book um, by his pastor, his name is Francis Chan, and he, he sort of was writing about this idea of fellowship, about how churches often call themselves a church family, but then when, when, each other, when, when they need each other, they're not really there. I think we do that pretty well as a church, actually. But. He, talk, he started talking about the difference between gangs and churches. I just want to talk about this for a minute. Because if a gang met once a week, if they met once a week, maybe twice a week, that would be the worst gang ever. They would get nothing criminal done. I know this is weird. 
But they are a family. It's, it's not good. It's sinful. But they're a family. They die for each other. They love each other. And most of our churches, we meet once or twice a week and we call ourselves family. But, but, but it's, 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 there's nothing real. It's not superficial. I mean, it is superficial. There's nothing deep there. I think it's sad that a gang is more connected and deeper than most churches are. I, but like I said, I think we, we, we do fellowship pretty well here. <clears throat> but the second thing that the early church was devoted to was fellowship. Fellowship with one another. They were devoted to the Word of God and they were devoted to doing it together. To living life together. Look at the third thing. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread. To the breaking of bread. Now I want to speak on this for a minute, what this means. Because it really means two things. They're talking about one specifically in this text, but what it really means is two things. The breaking of bread. Look at verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together... And breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Here, they, it is taught that the early church made it a practice to eat together. Not only did they spend time together, not only did they go to the temple daily together, but they ate together. They ate their meals together. There's something special about eating a meal with somebody. I mean, how many times did Jesus do it? Many of his thing, many of his miracles occurred at meals. There's like 15 different stories in the Bible where Jesus is eating with people. The Last Supper, of course, but he ate with all kinds of people. He ate with prostitutes and tax collectors and, and murderers. Jesus ate, and, and there's something special about eating a meal with people. But the breaking of bread also has this connotation in the Bible of communion. The breaking of bread. The breaking of bread. And, and communion is such a beautiful picture. I believe that the church should be more devoted to communion because it's a physical picture of the gospel. It's a physical picture of Christ's body being broken like the bread is broken. It's a physical picture of His blood being poured out like the wine or the juice is poured out. It's a beautiful picture of the Gospel because without Christ's body and blood, we're dead. We're enemies of God, still stuck, stuck in our sin. And I love that the picture of communion is we eat the bread. We, we drink the wine or the, or the juice because, because Jesus is our food. He is our nourishment. Without Him, we are empty. He is our drink. I love that the Bible calls Jesus the, the bread of life, the living water, because we need to feast on Him. And that's the beauty of communion. He's the meal and He's the host of the meal. He is what we need. He satisfies our need. And I can testify to that because when I was in high school, I was not a follower of Jesus. I've told many of you all this similar story, but I just lived for the world. I was a partier. I, was, I had this emptiness inside of me that I tried to fill with uh, relationships or just empty things that everybody says will fill you. But everything just left me empty. But when I met Jesus, when I heard the gospel for the first time, it was, it, it was the sense that I was finally complete. I, what I was made for was to worship Jesus. And for that, for that first time when I experienced Him, I was fulfilled. I was filled. Because I was feasting on the bread and the living water of Jesus. Nothing else can fulfill you. So the early church was devoted to the breaking of bread, to eating meals together, but, but this, this practice of communion, what that shows us is so beautiful. The last part in verse 42, 
And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And the prayers. What is the life of the believer if we're not praying? The Apostle Paul tells us to be constant in prayer. To, to be praying as we go. As you're walking down the street, just, just pray in your mind. To be constantly talking to the Father. God has given us this ability to have eternal conversation with Him starting right now. And so many of us just ignore that. But the early church was devoted to prayer. Look at this sheet. Look at how many names are on this sheet. These, these, this, is a, this is a list that we have. This is just for May. It's, it changes each month. This is, this is a list of people in this church and people we know that need prayer. If we, were, if we were truly devoted to prayer, that would be so amazing for these people. And, and I know so many of us have many more names not on this list that need prayer. Did you know that prayer works? Did you know that the Lord hears prayers? God does heal. God does answer prayers. There's value in us praying, but it's more than just us asking things for God and Him giving us things. God is not a vending machine. He's not indebted to us. He gives because He's generous, but, but the, the, the concept of prayer is so that we can speak to the Creator of the universe. The creator of all things. The God that says, I know the number of hairs on your head. I'm sorry, Miss Linda. I thought of Don. That was such a bad thought. I was thinking he didn't have many hairs. but God still knows the few number of hairs he has. Anyway. That God loves us and cares for us so much that not only does he, did He create us, but He wants to have constant conversation with you. The Lord speaks. And this is His primary way that He speaks through His Word. Prayer is necessary. I want to ask you, don't answer, just in your minds, how often do you pray for yourself? You think about that. How often do I pray for myself? And then I want to ask you, how often do you pray for others, for your family, for your friends, loved ones? I'd be willing to bet that the first number was larger than the second number. That's just how we are. We humans put themselves first. Jesus taught us not to do that. He, he taught us what love looks like by, by putting yourself last, by actually dying to yourself. But prayer, asking for things is vital. Asking things for yourself is important, but... But my third question I want to ask you is, how often do you just sit? Sit before God. Not even say anything. Just, you're just there before Him. You're just there at the feet of Jesus. Just sitting, listening. How often do we do that? I bet it would be a very low number. But it's interesting because when, when we look in the Bible, there's so many beautiful moments that happen. At silence. We're constantly talking. We're constantly saying things. And, and prayer ha has an aspect of that. But there's, there's, there comes a moment in prayer when we just need to stop talking and listen to the Lord. The Bible says, be still and know. Be still. Stop moving. Stop thinking. It's okay. The world's not going to end if we don't do something for an hour. Be still and know that I am God. If we rested in that, even once a week, just, just decided, I'm going to just do nothing. I'm just going to sit outside and I'm just going to be still. And just the only thought in my mind is that you are God. Prayer is important. Jesus thought prayer was important. Jesus, in His full manhood, oftentimes 
chose not to heal people. He would walk away and he would go pray. On the top of a mountain, he would speak to his Father in heaven. Sometimes there's, there's good opportunities, but there's no better choice than spending time with the Lord. So these are the four things that the early church was devoted to. They were devoted to the Word of God. They were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to the breaking of bread. They were devoted to prayer. If I had to say, what are four things you are devoted to? What are four things you are intensely putting effort forth in? I wonder what that would be. And that's not, that's not me throwing stones. I, 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 I'm intensely have effort in so many different areas other than these four, but I believe... Can you just imagine what a church would look like if everybody was seriously devoted to God's Word, seriously devoted to prayer, seriously devoted to fellowship and breaking of the bread? 3,000 souls that came together were that devoted. That was the early church. Can you imagine that? And there were results. Because when we're walking in, in, in what God desires for us and for the church, there's going to be mighty results. Look at verse 43. And awe came upon every soul. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Not just so we're not confused. I want to make it clear. None of us are apostles. There are no more apostles. The, the apostles were given this, this miraculous power by the Lord Jesus to uh, heal and to cast out demons and do these incredible things. I believe God still heals and does miraculous things, but there are no more apostles. But the beginning of this, Verse 43, and all came upon every soul. I want to tell you, let's just start with one thing. If you are devoted to the Word of God, all will come upon your soul. If you are devoted to any of these things, all will come upon your soul. If we're confused what awe is, awe, awe and wonder, I, I shared this this. Bible passage before, but it's so impactful when I think about awe and reverence to the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah receives this vision from the Lord, and it's literally God in His throne room. A mighty vision He receives, and He sees, He doesn't even see the fullness of His glory, He sees the, the trail of His robe. The Bible says His trail of His robe filled the temple where Isaiah was. Do you know what his response was? His response was, he fell down and he said, Woe is me! That means cursed is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. That's all. That's this realization of how holy and amazing and beautiful God is. And at the same time, that lowers you a lot. When you have a real wreck. When you have a realization of how amazing and holy and perfect God is, there's no way you could walk out prideful. Because you realize that you were broken, you were guilty. Not only that, but you were the one that put Jesus on the cross. The result of being devoted to the Lord is all upon your soul. Have you ever experienced that? Having awe upon your soul. Of, of realizing how amazing and beautiful the Lord is. How high and lifted up, how holy He is, and how, how broken we are. <laughs> that same person, Isaiah, later in his book, he would say, My best works, my best things I've ever done, are filthy rags compared to you. That's why works could never save us because it's filthy rags compared to the Lord. Our good works are not even comparable to what God says is good. 
That's why we need His grace and thank the Lord that He lavishes grace on us. But the result of devotion to the Lord is awe. So if we're missing that awe, if, we, if, if, if we're just going through the motions, we, we, we don't read the Word and really come to this conclusion of, wow, God, You are so holy. Or, wow, God, You are so good. The awe is missing. And if it's missing, it means we're not devoted. And our hearts aren't burning for His Word. I want you to read verse 47 with me. Verse 47 says, I'll start with 46, it makes more sense. And day by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Verse 47, praising God, and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Two more results of devotion to the Lord. First of all, worship. Worship. Verse 47 says they were all praising God. When you're this devoted and when there's awe upon your soul, you don't want to do anything else than just give God praise and tell Him how good He is. Tell Him thank you for the sacrifice. But look at the final result of this, and it's beautiful. The Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. When we're devoted to the Lord Jesus, there's a ripple effect. Day by day. There's a ripple effect on the people in our lives. On our, on our family members, on our co-workers, even our friends. There's a ripple effect when they see how much you really love Jesus, how much time you spend with Jesus, how your heart just, just burns for Jesus. They look at you and say, wow, you know what? I want that. Because when they see somebody that goes through trials, and <laughs> when they see somebody that's on the verge of death and they're smiling saying, I just can't wait to see Jesus, there's a ripple effect. They say, wow, I don't have that peace. Amen. You know, when I got saved, I was, I was 17. I was in high school. I was living with my dad at the time. He, he, was, he was a Christian, but it, it wasn't pure devotion. When I got saved, you know, I, I didn't understand the importance of sharing my faith or anything like that. But I was so hungry for Jesus. I was so hungry for Jesus, I would just watch sermons after sermons and, and just listen to things. And, 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 you know, when we would be hanging out, me and my dad, I would just say, hey, you want to watch this with me? And, and it wasn't even a purposeful thing, but before I knew it, he's devoted to Jesus. And now he's absolutely devoted to Jesus. This is the ripple effect that happened. A couple of weeks ago, I told you my brother, after years of me actually trying to get him saved, he finally gave his life to Jesus last year about this time. And my mother has gotten so much more devoted to the Lord. This is the ripple effect of devotion to Jesus. Because people see that change. Oh my goodness, my family saw the change in me. By the grace of the Lord. So I want to challenge all of us today. This isn't me challenging you. This is a challenge for myself as well because I know I need to be more devoted in all of these things. But I want to challenge you today to be devoted, first of all, to God's Word. Be devoted to the voice of God. Because when you're devoted, your life will be transformed. And this is our spiritual food. We're, we're unhealthy if we're not feasting on. Number two, I want to challenge you to be devoted to fellowship. Whether that means with, with us in this room today, or, or to your family, to your friends, be devoted to bearing one another's burdens. Be devoted to caring for others, helping others. Number three, I want to challenge you to be devoted to the breaking of bread. Eating with other people. Maybe people you're not even close with. 
sharing meals with other people, having people over in your house for meals, like the Lord Jesus was devoted to breaking bread. And lastly, I want to challenge you to be devoted to prayer. Be devoted to praying for your needs. Be devoted for praying for others' needs, because there's so many. But also be devoted just to be with the Lord. Sometimes we need that, that be still and know. Just rest before the Lord. Because there are results. And the greatest result is that we have a deeper, intimate relationship with Jesus. Salvation is free, but intimacy, real relationship takes work. But the results are we are going to be in absolute awe of God. Your relationship with God will be transformed if we have this devotion. And lastly, souls will be saved. As there's a ripple effect to devotion. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we just are so grateful for the ability to gather together, for the freedom to gather together, and proclaim the holy and beautiful words of the Lord. I pray today that as we leave, we would have a, a, a new look on Your Word, a new look on prayer, and we would just desire it. Help us, desire, help us to desire You, Lord, more than ever before. Lord, I love You so much. We love You so much. I pray that You bless all of us and help us to just pant for Your heart. We love You, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. something. We pray you just bless it and help us have a good time of fellowship. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.